Will ethanol derived from corn help reduce our dependence on foreign oil? Many experts say yes, but only in the short term. There are long-term solutions for providing our transportation energy needs and for helping to beat prices at the pump. Rapidly growing grasses such as this miscanthus plant or algae can help provide a new generation of biofuel solutions and they offer the advantage of not requiring land that is desperately needed to grow food. Join us as scientists, business leaders and economic experts from all over the world gather together at UC San Diego to discuss how biofuels will help meet our future transportation energy needs and also contribute to the mitigation of global warming. So, I'm going to talk about this uh, nexus between energy, food, uh, and uh, environmental issues, especially greenhouse gases, but also some other ones. And I want to just first make some points, which maybe are obvious to all of you, but maybe there will be a point for debate and discussion at the end of this talk. Um, so this food, fuel, biodiversity uh, nexus, if you will, um, I would assert there is right now suggestive evidence, but reason to imagine that it will be much more than suggestive in the future about uh, potential competition between food and biofuel. And I think these are the kinds of issues we're going to be facing if we do produce biofuels on the same quality of land that can be used to produce food. Whether we actually use a food crop for a biofuel or just use the same fertile land that could have produced a food crop I think is irrelevant. It is using fertile lands to make biofuels that I think is, is a major issue that I want to talk about today. Um, and it's an issue, as the next point says here, because what ultimately happens if you use a food crop or the fertile land that could produce the food is you end up pricing food at the price of oil. And when you price food at the price of oil, there are several billion people around the world who spend less on food than we spend on a month or so of filling up a car with gasoline. And they're the ones who have a, an immense disadvantage. Uh, we won't notice it. The wealthier people of the world won't really notice this very much. But the, the less wealthy of the world will notice it. And into this context, as I'll show you uh, later on, uh, we have to think about what's happening to the world. Uh, agricultural demand is doubling. Uh, biofuels could easily consume quite a bit of land. Um, and then you have to ask other questions, which I won't talk about much, but I just want to mention now. If to get new land, we take it from nature. We take it from existing, the remaining existing ecosystems of the world. Uh, and when you convert native ecosystem into uh, cropland, be it for food or biofuel, for grazing, whatever it might be, um, we release the immense carbon stores that was in that biomass. We lose those habitats. We lose the organisms living in them. We threaten many of those species, ultimately, uh, with extinction. So we have a, a loss of biological diversity. So here are the forces. We all know this. Global energy consumption has been increasing rapidly. It goes up as people's incomes go up. It's projected to double again, which it did in the last 35 years, uh, within the next uh, 40 years. And with uh, elevated concern about greenhouse gas release, if the energy that we use in the future comes from uh, fossil sources, as we know, uh, there are some major implications for global climate change. Well, the same thing is happening for food. Global food production doubled in the last 35 years. This was the Green Revolution. Well, it's going to be doubling again, all the projections say, within the next 50 years, demand for food. And to the extent to which growing more food requires more land, that will also entail large releases of greenhouse gas. For the last century, about 40 percent of all the greenhouse gases released to the atmosphere did not come from fossil fuels. They came from land clearing and land use. So here's the uh, a qualitative statement about the global land base. There's about 14 and a half billion hectares of land. Six billion hectares of this is a very marginal utility to, uh, to humans. Uh, it's Antarctica, it's other icy habitats, tundra, desert, uh, boreal lands, and so on. About eight and a half billion hectares are generally usable. Of that, about three billion are, are suitable for rain-fed agriculture. About uh, two billion of these, of, of this land, uh, uh, of, of remaining, of, of other earth land right now is in uh, forest or savanna uh, ecosystems. And clearly there are forest products that are very important to us. We don't just need energy and food. We also need wood, paper, and so on that we get from forests. Cultivated crops use about one and a half billion hectares of land. 
That's about 50% more land than the land mass of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. Um, grazing uses another 3.5 billion hectares of land. And I might point out that grazing land, farmers who graze land choose to graze it because they make more money grazing than they would growing a crop on it. And they do that because grazing lands are less fertile than crop lands. And what I want to talk about is, a, is another slice of land. When land is farmed, uh, depending upon the quality of the land and how the land is farmed, land often can become too infertile after farming, become degraded by farming because of erosion, uh, loss of, of, of carbon and nitrogen from the soil and other such processes that the land is abandoned from agriculture and, and people no longer try to farm it. And the UN uh, says there are about 500 million hectares of agriculturally degraded and abandoned land around the world. I want to talk about what that kind of land might be able to produce for biofuel, because if we use that land, as I will show you, there are a whole host of potential advantages uh, to it. So might these lands be an alternative way to grow biofuel feedstocks? Well, it would be nice, as I said, to have a, 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 land, have a feedstock that might minimize this conflict between food production and biofuel production, and clearly this would do so. Um, it'd be nice also to have a biomass feedstock that could be produced with low inputs. The issue is what, what might we be able to do with much lower inputs of, of uh, fertilizer. Um, and as I'll show you, degraded soils have the potential to actually increase their carbon stores through time, depending upon how they're used. And that could be a big benefit for uh, biofuels. Well, you might ask, what could you grow on degraded lands? Well, I would say, uh, I would look what grows on nutrient-poor lands in a given region. Because the plants of a given region are the ones that are already adapted to the climate, uh, to the various diseases, pests, and so on around there. Um, another thing is if you grow the native plants of a region, it is the plants that live in a region that actually created those soils in the first place. So the plant ecosystems that lived, let's say, in the Great Plains, generated the rich, fertile soils of the Great Plains that we use for agriculture. And it might be by putting some of those plants back on those soils, you could restore some of those degraded soils. Uh, and in doing so, increase their fertility, giving you higher yields on your biofuel through time, and increasing carbon stores on them. Well, we uh, did an experiment uh, at a place in Minnesota called Cedar Creek Natural History Area, which is about uh, 22 square kilometers of land that was donated to the University of Minnesota in the 1950s. I might point out why it was donated. There are a variety of wonderful attributes this land has, one of which was that it was very cheap because it was located on very sandy soils, soils that had the lowest agricultural production of any county in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and we did an experiment on a field that had been farmed. Uh, the soil had become so highly degraded it was abandoned from agriculture after about 40 years of farming. Uh, and the experiment we did, we wanted to plant out uh, a variety of different native prairie plants one at a time and then in various mixtures, which I'll show you in a minute. The plots were never fertilized. Uh, they were uh, irrigated the first year to try to get germination to be uh, more successful. So here are the results. This, is, this came out in, in science last year. The bioenergy produced, this is gigajoules of, of, uh, of energy per hectare per year. Uh, and you can see what happened with the uh, monoculture plots. Uh, here's the most productive monoculture plot, which was a legume. Here are the other monoculture plots. Right there, that's the mean of three switchgrass plots. Switchgrass is a, a very ordinary species on these highly degraded soils. Um, and if you sort of look at what's happening here, the, the mean 16 species plot uh, was 238% more productive than the mean monoculture. And look at another way, if you even go for the absolute best species growing in monoculture, it was much less productive than the mean of the 16 species plots. There were only a few 16 species plots that were uh, as unproductive as the single best uh, species growing in monoculture. So higher diversity here led to higher productivity. This was the, the first such experiment like this set up in the world, trying to look at the effects of the joint effects, interactive effects of which species were growing in a plot and how many species, composition and diversity on the functioning of an ecosystem. Um, and we asked why that might happen, and there are a couple things that were going on here. First, as when plots were more diverse, there was more complete utilization of the main limiting nutrient. That is the concentration of extractable soil nitrate. Nitrate is the main limiting nutrient in these systems, and these are individual measurements taken throughout the growing season. On average, 
the highest diversity plots, we're able to drive soil nitrate down to about a third of that which the average monoculture uh, added at. So there was more complete utilization of the main limiting resource, which is one thing which led to higher productivity. Um, another thing which led to higher productivity uh, is sort of summarized in this graph, and part of it is the presence of legumes. Uh, on a low nitrogen soil, legumes are very important. You can look at what happened. If we look at all the plots that had no legumes planted, all the 16 species plots had legumes, so there's no point out here, but these are all the plots without legumes going one, two, four, and eight species. There was and this is just the mean of about 15 replicates. There's actually a, a significant increase in product productivity as you add species even without any legumes present. But if you in include legumes present, there's still an increase with diversity, uh, but the whole curve is, is shifted up. And in fact, of that 238% greater productivity at, in the high diversity plots, in the 16 species plots, about 110% of that increase comes from the presence of legumes, and about 130% comes from other effects attributable to the number of plant species, to plant diversity, if you will, to interactions among these. These species have complementary traits, which is really why they can coexist in nature as they do. Uh, there's another feature we saw of these systems. Uh, we saw that with increased diversity, there was less year-to-year -year variation uh, in the productivity. So the yields that we had from one year to the next in re, uh, and how yield change in response to climate was less variable at high diversity than it was in the low diversity plots. The high diversity plots were about 70% more stable on average than were the low diversity plots. So what happens if we get this biomass? Well, we've, we heard already talks about how, the, how biomass can be converted into various energy sources. And this is, um, this is sort of maybe kicking some what I hope are dead uh, horses here, uh, corn, ethanol and soy biodiesel, but just to show you how uh, the current biofuels compare to what could happen if you grew uh, biomass, in this case we grew it with no inputs of any kind, on this very degraded soil, highly infertile soil, and what you can see is the ratio is just barely above one for corn ethanol, a bit higher for soybean biodiesel, but when you use this uh, high diversity prairie biomass to make electricity or to make uh, cellulosic ethanol or use uh, gasification technology to make uh, fisher trove syn fuels, uh, you have ratios here of five to oh, eight or so for the energy out compared to the energy in uh, in this process. You can also look at the energy gain per hectare that you have. And this is uh, corn ethanol, net energy gain, uh, grown on, this is on average for the five most productive states uh, for corn in the Midwest. Uh, soybeans, net energy gain uh, per hectare. And you can compare that with what you have for the high diversity mixtures, these low input, high diversity, I call them LIHD, low input, high diversity mixtures, are 16 species plots grown with no inputs of any kind on this incredibly infertile soil uh, in Minnesota, highly infertile soil. And uh, you can see that per hectare, we're getting about the same and with gasification technology, uh, a bit more energy per hectare of this infertile land than we do from corn and soybeans. The other point I want to make is that if you actually did these same kind of calculations, if you wanted to sort of uh, hype this, if you will, as opposed to just presenting uh, these results, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, um, on normal lands, on the normal abandoned degraded land, let's say CRP lands, uh, biomass, prairie biomass growing there is two or more times more productive than on our incredibly nutrient poor soils that we bulldoze the topsoil off of. So these bars are twice as tall to three times as tall under those conditions. Um, and here's, uh, here's sort of a, another point I want to make. This sort of illustrates the problem. This was a, a prairie restoration. It was a restoration done in which very few legumes were added, so there wasn't much legume biomass in it, less than 10%. But here's what happened. So uh, it was a, a, a restoration done from, the, from a hill down to a, a, a swale by a stream. This is what it was on the hilltop, the dry, uh, eroded, sandy soils, very low production, about comparable to our average monoculture plot. Uh, here is what we actually had in our high diversity plots on, on uh, equally or, or maybe even more poor, poor soils than that. But here's what happened when we went a bit down, on the uh, foot of the hill, a more mesic, moister soil or in really wet soil. Uh, the ratio of that to that is 5.3, 5.3 times more production within about 100 meters of each other, whether you're on top of a hill or at the base of a hill. So it's really important to have field studies that dread the compare a given kind of biomass production with another kind of biomass production side by side, replicated across a, a, a large geographic region before we can make any strong conclusions about which of these ideas that are out there right now are better. I don't know which one is better, but I know that uh, we don't have the data yet really to make the comparisons we need to make. 
Now, I told, talked about diversity effects. Um, when we first did this work, uh, and we showed uh, in, a, in a couple papers in Science and Nature that, um, that there were these very strong effects of plant diversity on productivity and on stability and so on, it led to a, a bit of debate. In fact, quite a bit of debate among ecologists. It wasn't an idea that was very prevalent in ecology, and most ecologists thought the diversity was of great unimportance. And so when our work came out uh, from this experiment, there was a lot of debate, and many different people tried to uh, test this in different experiments. And my favorite paper testing this was one that a guy named Frank Berensee and his student Jasper von Reuten did. Um, it was my favorite because Berensee had written a very critical article about our work, pointing out what he thought all the problems with it might be and saying that he thought that uh, it, it was only happening because we were working on very nutrient-poor soils, and it was only happening because we included legumes. He said without nutrient-poor soils and legumes, those two factors together, he asserted there would probably be almost no effect of diversity on productivity. So he did an experiment, he's a Dutch scientist in, in the Netherlands on very fertile Dutch soils, in which he put out uh, herbaceous plants, grasses if you will, and forbs, but no legumes. And here are his results. With two species, there's about a 50% increase in production, with four species, uh, what is that, maybe 75 or so percent increase. Uh, by the time you're out here at eight species plots and the fourth year of the experiment, he had almost the same ratio of his high diversity plot, his eight species plot, to his monoculture as we had in our experiment. So we went from, uh, if you will, being quite cynical about these results to con he concluded that there was uh, evidence that the same phenomena occurred in, under the conditions which he thought would be very unlikely to occur without any legumes on very fertile soils. Uh, much greater increase, if you will, in productivity with diversity than he ever imagined might happen. There's a paper that came out in Nature last year, a year after Berenstein's paper, in which uh, Cardinal et al. did a, a meta-analysis of, of over 100 different um, experiments, biodiversity experiments, that explored what is the effect of the number of species in an ecosystem on their productivity. And across all these studies, they didn't find any effect of what kind of organism it was. It didn't matter. But uh, they did find that on average, the high diversity treatment, whatever it was, their highest diversity treatment was about twice as productive as their low diversity treatment. So it's uh, now become fairly widely accepted among ecologists that there is a fairly strong effect of the number of species on the productivity of a system. So I think the results I showed you for pro a diversity affecting productivity for biofuel production, I think are a real result and we have every expectation to see that in a wide variety of ecosystems and conditions around the world. That was sort of surprise one from this experiment. This was, to me, the biggest surprise. This has to do with soil carbon. Well, you probably know this, but soils are the largest terrestrial storehouse of biologically active carbon. Soils have about twice as much carbon in them as all the vegetation and, and the on the land surface has in them. Uh, and they have uh, about twice as much as, as, in, uh, as in the atmosphere. And so what we do to soils can have a big impact on, on global uh, carbon cycles. Well, we actually looked at the dynamics of this in these plots, and this shows the uh, annual rate of storage of carbon, and we showed it in terms of the, amount, the mass of CO2 that would be removed from the atmosphere and stored. And what we see is that we get about 4.4 tons per hectare of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere and stored as soil organic matter per year in the high diversity treatments. We had no significant effect of the monocultures on stored carbon. And if you ask well, how much fossil carbon do you have to release to uh, plant the prairie in the first place, uh, to grow the seed to plant it, to uh, build the tractor to uh, mow it for hay, to build the rake to pile it up, the combine to bale it, et cetera, the baler to bale it, to haul it to a place to be processed into biofuel. You have about 0.3 tons per hectare of fossil CO2 that is released in the whole process of producing that biomass and hauling it to a place to be, have it converted into some kind of, let's say, liquid biofuel. With 4.4 being stored, it means you have about four tons of CO2 per hectare per year net sequestration in the soil beyond any fossil CO2 released. What this means is if you can use the energy in the biomass to convert that biomass into a biofuel, which is how all of the uh, processes for making uh, biofuels now are proposed to, to do the operation, when you burn that biofuel and, it goes in, uh, and the carbon dioxide goes in the air, the, the carbon dioxide in the biofuel had been in the air beforehand, so it came from the air to the plant to the air again, but other carbon dioxide in the air went to the plant and into the soil where it will stay for a long, long period of time. It will stay there as long, in essence, 
uh, as you leave this in this high diversity mixture of plants. So you actually can make biofuels that in the whole process of making them and burning them, you have less carbon dioxide in the air than you had beforehand because you have this carbon dioxide building up over about a hundred year period in the soil. So you end up making uh, what we call carbon negative biofuels. So here is the greenhouse gas reduction. There are two components to this. Corn ethanol releases greenhouse gas, but there's a reduction here shown because you use corn ethanol to substitute for gasoline and you get rid of some of the fossil greenhouse gas that gasoline would have released by making corn ethanol. So there's a bit of an advantage for making corn ethanol or making soybean biodiesel. But if you look at what happens when you grow this high diversity, low input uh, biomass and convert it to electricity or ethanol or some kind of uh, fisher troph sin fuel, uh, you not only have the, the advantage of displacing the fossil fuel, which is about half of the height of each of these bars, but you also have the advantage of the carbon being stored in the soil. So these are massively carbon negative biofuels. You basically have almost double the benefit of the displacement of the fossil fuel by the carbon that's being stored in the soils. Now there are other advantages. I said we grew these without any inputs. So you can actually um, look at uh, what the fertilizer input, how many kilograms per hectare of fertilizer is, is used in corn for both nitrogen and green and phosphorus and pink or in soybeans and what the inputs would be here. Now we didn't actually add any inputs but we asked what is the nutrient content of the biomass we are removing? And we, and we said, well, in the long term, we probably should add that amount back in. It's not an issue for nitrogen because the legumes fix so much nitrogen and soil nitrogen levels are going up through time. But what you can see is that the fertilizer input is trivial compared to that for uh, dedicated uh, uh, agricultural crops, as are the pesticides input. And the only pesticide that we use at all, we use Roundup to kill off the pre-existing pasture vegetation that was in that field before we uh, we seeded it out. Okay, so then you can ask, are these yields that we have sustainable? In Woodson County, Kansas is a county which many people actually never broke the soil. They're just mowing it for hay. And this shows hay yields for, for 55 years, up and down, up and down. They're not very good yields, uh, but it shows their yields through time uh, on, on this hay. No inputs of any kind, no fertilizer, no pesticide, no irrigation. Uh, and yet after 55 years, they don't have what you might imagine would be a decline in yield because of lack of inputs. Here, an experiment in England is called the a park grass experiment at Rothamsted. Started 150 years ago. These are data from 1900, started in 1856, 1900 to uh, now. And these plots are actually becoming more and more productive through time with nothing ever added to them. So I think it is sustainable. Um, what could we do with this? So let's say we go back to uh, our, the beginning of this, the five billion, uh, the half a billion hectares of land, I said this degraded land that might be usable to make uh, biofuels. How much might it produce? Well, this is land that's spread all around the world, and I'm going to give you what is just a ballpark guess. I have no idea what reality is. It's going to take a lot more work to try to explore this idea for other ecosystem types around the world. But we do know on average how productive the wet tropics are, how much biomass they produce every year, the dry tropics, and so on around the world. We know what land mass is in them. Uh, from that, you can make an estimate uh, that 500 uh, million hectares of land could give us about 150 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent ethanol. That's the gasoline equivalent uh, amount. Uh, and I think if you look at the total transportation uh, uh, liquids used around the world, that's got to be about, what, 25% or so of it is in that ballpark. So there's a potential to get quite a bit of energy without having uh, some of the uh, detrimental effects that come when we get land another way. Because how else do we get land? Well, we have about five billion hectares of the eight and a half billion hectares of the Earth's surface already used for agriculture, for grazing, and so on. If we get more land for agriculture, if we need more fertile soils, they're going to come out of some kind of native ecosystem. And whether or not you have any other reason to care about native ecosystems, you have to realize that intact ecosystems have very large amounts of carbon in them. Half of the dry mass of trees is carbon. When land is cleared to grow food crops or biofuels, that carbon becomes carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse gas. Not only above ground carbon, all the roots decompose through time, that is released, and as the soil is tilled, about 40% of the carbon in the soil becomes greenhouse gas. Massive greenhouse gas impacts from expanding agricultural production, which may happen, if we don't have yields go up through time and from converting land for biofuels. So if we need more fertile land for food or for biofuels, either one, the greenhouse gas implications of that are quite large. What I've tried to do 
today is to suggest to you uh, that yield may not be the only issue or the most critical issue in producing biofuels. High yield necessarily means either high inputs and or very fertile soils. There are some costs to both high inputs and very fertile soils that make the result in fuels less likely to do one of the things we want a biofuel to do, which is to provide greenhouse gas advantages. So what I'm suggesting is that we should explore the possibility that there is a storehouse of degraded land around the world which might be able to provide us with a reasonable amount of biofuel, which when combined with greater energy efficiencies and vehicles and so on, might, uh, might give some of the, if you will, the, the fossil fuel independence and that various nations would like to have uh, and a long-term renewable source of energy, but that also by growing biofuels on these degraded soils, which can store carbon, we get this two-for-one effect. We have about twice the greenhouse gas reduction that we get just by displacing the biofuel because of the carbon that can be stored in these soils that are being made more fertile through time uh, by the reintroduced high-diversity mixtures of plants. If we can use these lands, we clearly will prevent some of the otherwise uh, uh, conversion and destruction of native ecosystems. We'll be able to prevent uh, that greenhouse gas release, release, prevent that loss of their biological diversity. As I showed you, there's lower leaching rates of nutrients from these high diversity mixtures uh, than uh, from low diversity mixtures of still these perennial plants and much less than from growing a dedicated energy crop that receives fertilizer. So I'm not going to claim that these low input high diversity biofuels are a cure-all, but I think they're a hypothesis that's very worthy of much further exploration. Thank you. Mm -hmm.